Okay, good evening. Welcome to the rescheduled uh, Parkway School Board meeting from last week. Uh, today is Tuesday, February 16th, and we will begin the meeting. Uh, if I could ask everyone to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, of the United States, States of America and to, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty indivisible. and justice for all. Okay, we uh, are absent one board secretary, so I will call roll this evening. Ms. Davis? Here. Mrs. Hill? Here. Mrs. Hopper? I see you, yep. Mr. Schindler? Here. Dr. Ciratino? Here. Mr. Seltzer? I see Mr. Seltzer. Uh, and I'm Mr. Todd, I am here. Uh, we have no closed session this evening. And uh, so we'll move right along. Um, this evening, we are at recognizing an outstanding group of Parkway students. We're honoring seven students who received a perfect score on the ACT or uh, college admission and placement exam. We'll also honor Brian Reeves, who was named Outstanding Music Educator of the Year. In addition, the Board of Education apparently will be recognized. Uh, first, I'd like to invite Dr. Kevin Beckner, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching, Learning and Accountability to recognize our perfect ACT students. Dr. Beckner. Well, good evening, President Todd, Vice President Hopper, members of the board, and Dr. Marty. Tonight, we're pleased to recognize a number of Parkway students who've shown the incredible ability to be academically successful. The ACT is a curriculum-based achievement exam that measures what students have learned in school, and scores from the exam are accepted by all major four-year colleges and universities across the U.S. The ACT consists of tests in English, mathematics, reading, and science, and each is scored on a scale of one to 36. A student's composite score is the average of the four tests. The score for ACT's optional writing test is reported separately and is not included in the ACT composite score. Fewer than half of 1% of students who take the ACT earn a top score. In the US high school graduating class of 2020, only 5,500 out of over 1.6 million students who took the ACT earned the top composite score of 36. Students who earn a 36 composite score have likely mastered all of the skills and knowledge they will need to be successful in first year college courses in the core subject areas. We're incredibly proud of the Parkway students who have achieved a 36 on the ACT. And tonight we're honored to recognize seven students who have done just that. Tonight, we'll begin with a student from South High, Riley Darrow. From West High, Clementine Arneson. From West High, Grace Dong. From West High, Shri Jalabi. From West High, Caleb Levy. From West High, McKay Morgan. And from West High, Nathan Zhao. Congratulations to these incredibly accomplished Parkway students and we wish you continued success in the years ahead. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Congratulations indeed. Next, we're honoring Brian Reeves from North High. Uh, at this time, please welcome via a video, Dr. Tori Kane, principal at North High. Dr. Kane will introduce Brian Reeves and share details of the award he received. Good evening, President Todd, members of the board, Dr. Marty, Mrs. Stover, on behalf of the North High staff, it is with great pleasure and excitement that I join you here this evening to share with pride the outstanding accomplishment of Mr. Brian Reeves. Each year, the National Federation of High Schools awards the Outstanding Music Educator of the Year to one recipient in each state. This year, Misha has recognized Brian Reeves as the 2021 Missouri State Award recipient. 
Mr. Reeves is currently in his 29th year as a music, music educator. Currently, he teaches choir and general music courses at North High. Prior to this position, he taught choir at Odessa Junior High and Odessa High School in o Odessa, Missouri. His choirs have been selected to perform twice at the Missouri Music Educators Association Conference. During his tenure at Parkway North, choirs have received 24 consecutive exemplary ratings at the Misha State Large Ensemble Festival. Brian is involved in and held leadership positions in several professional music education organizations. He served as president of the Missouri Choral Directors Association and is currently past president of the Missouri Music Educators Association. He has presented sessions to state leaders as a National Association for Music Education National Assembly in Washington, D.C., and the National Association for Music Education Southwest Division. Mr. Reeves and his wife, Stacy Reeves, are proud North Area residents and parents to two Viking students, Molly and Henry. Please join me in congratulating Brian Reeves on this outstanding and well-deserved achievement. Thank you, Brian. Congratulations, indeed. Thank you. Next, we will have uh, some very brief remarks by Dr. Marty uh, regarding School Board Recognition Week. Thank you, President Todd and members of the board. And uh, I don't know how brief they're gonna be, but I'll, I'll, I'll move it along. But uh, uh, Governor Mike Parsons has declared February 14th to the 20th, 2021, as School Board Recognition Week in Missouri. And actually by the movement of this meeting from last week to this week, we're right in the midst of for that, uh, that proclamation. Before I read the governor's proclamation, I, along with my fellow SAP members, have put together a packet of statements that uh, Mrs. Stover will send to you, personal expressions of our individual gratitude to you and your service to students, family, staff, and our entire community. I had the opportunity to read my colleagues' written statements and I will share briefly some themes that I pulled out of these statements. First of all, focus on students, be it students learning, safety, mental health, and or future needs. Strong leadership as displayed most recently, courageous and disciplined approach to problem solving in the times that we're in right now. Empathy, as shown to the many stakeholders, the board recognizes and listens to all voices here in the Parkway community. Unselfishness, as seen continually in the time you devote to your board responsibilities and your desire to focus attention on others, students and educators. And finally, collaboration and cooperation as demonstrated by the board's working relationship with one another, with district leadership, principals, our teachers and educators, nurses, operations staff, everyone that uh, the board comes in contact with. On a personal note, as superintendent, I'm very proud to serve alongside you. I appreciate your support as well as the high expectations you have of me and those in the leadership positions. You challenge us with your questions and your concerns. I also very much appreciate and honor your role as stewards of our community, taxpayers, and our students. And so now I'd like to read the proclamation from Governor Parsons. Whereas a system of quality public education is essential to the future of our state and nation, and whereas the people of Missouri have a strong tradition of support for public education in their local school districts, and whereas Local school boards are the ultimate expression of the unique American institution of representative government of public school districts. And whereas local school boards acting on behalf of and in close connections with the people in their communities chart the direction of education in their communities. And whereas local school boards serve as a key community advocate for all children, youth, and the public schools. Now, therefore, I, Michael Parson, governor of the state of Missouri, who hereby proclaim February 14th to the 20th to be School Board Recognition Week in Missouri and urge all Missourians to recognize school boards as they strive with their communities to improve our public schools through their quality leadership. And, and believe me in Parkway, we are so indebted to all of you for your quality service, your leadership, uh, the way you conduct yourselves and uh, model really sound leadership for all of us here in Parkway. So congratulations and thank you for your service on behalf of our entire community and certainly 
the educators that uh, I represent, we're so great, grateful for you and your service. We'll be sending you uh, all the comments so you can enjoy them uh, at your leisure. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments, Dr. Marty. We, uh, we very much appreciate them. And uh, I think I can speak on behalf of the board uh, when I say it, uh, it is indeed our pleasure to, to serve the community uh, in the way that we have chosen and uh, we appreciate it. So um, as for the rest of our honorees tonight, uh, certificates have been mailed uh, to all the students recognized and also Mr. Reeves. Uh, thank you to our students and their families and Parkway staff for joining us virtually this evening to, uh, to see those folks uh, be honored. Parents, uh, you have some outstanding children and should be very proud of them. Moving on, uh, next we have several additions, corrections, and or modifications to tonight's agenda. Those are 6.01, addendum to agenda item 10.06, approval of personnel items. 6.02, modifications to agenda item 10.24, approval of McCarthy Building Companies Incorporated at GMP Amendment 3, Summer 2021 Construction Projects. 6.03, addition to of agenda item 10.39, approval of Parkway North High 2022 prom contract. 6.04, addition of agenda item 10.40, approval of the corporate partnership McCarthy Building Companies Incorporated. Uh, next up, public comments. We have no one signed up for public comments this evening. Um, next is the approval of our agenda for this evening. So may I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of Education scheduled for February 16th, 2021. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. The next regular scheduled board meeting will take place on Wednesday, March 10th, 2021, beginning at 7 p.m. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up for any uh, board liaison reports. Anybody have anything they'd like to share? I do. Um, I'm sure that, that uh, most of you who are watching are familiar with the Parkway Food Pantry. And I had the honor of becoming a part of the Far Parkway Food Pantry Advisory Committee, which just began meeting. And its role is to create a long-term vision and sustainability for the food pantry. Um, the pantry has been around for several years, but the services that it's been providing to this district have um, increased exponentially since March, 2020. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, since Mar just to give you a little bit more information about just how much this pantry is doing. Um, first of all, you may not realize this. Um, these are things that I learned in the meeting. Much of the Parkway School District could be considered a food desert, according to most definitions of that term. And one in five Parkway students are considered food insecure. That's a lot of students. Um, since March 2020, the usage of the pantry has increased by 400%. We're now serving 350 families. That's the equivalent of 1,600 people. And since March, the pantry has provided over 320,000 meals worth of food. I think we can all agree that this is um, a really important, it plays a really important role, role in Parkway's mission if kids are hungry, they can't learn. And so um, the part, the pantry so far has been doing this work um, based on the work of several of our district social workers, some administrators, a cadre of volunteers who have put in countless hours to keep this pantry running. And a large part of it is based on um, community partnerships and community donations. And um, the district administration realizes how important it is to make the pantry sustainable. It's now serving such an important role in the district that it needs to become a permanent part of what we do. And so I'm honored as a board member to be serving along with district administrators, staff, volunteers, and community partners to um, help develop an ongoing sustainable vision for the pantry.
Mr. Todd, I'll go next. Um, I have been uh, one of the parents that is a driver of their students uh, throughout the pandemic instead of using um, the school bus transportation. Uh, and I, I just really feel strongly that we need to acknowledge and thank all of our uh, building personnel who are standing out in the cold and the snow every day, twice a day, um, making sure that our kiddos are getting onto the school buses and into the school building safely. Uh, while I realize this might be a regular routine part of some functions of some personnel, it's not that for all, nor is it this extreme of temperature and cold and uh, weather conditions. So I just want to say thank you as a parent, as a board member, um, on behalf of all of us to say thank you for uh, going above and beyond at this at this time to make our students feel safe and make sure everybody's taken care of at this time. I'll go next. Uh, mine also relates to uh, that part of the day. I, um, you know, it's been a difficult year on a lot of fronts, but transportation wise, it's very difficult. You know, our, our bus drivers, you know, sort of had uncertainty baked into the first few months and you know, going back to last year, as far as their jobs at all. Uh, and, you know, they're tasked with a really important task of, uh, you know, navigating these roads, the routes are changing, the schedules are changing, there's a lot to keep on top of. Uh, so I just appreciate everything that our um, transportation department, our bus drivers do uh, for us and performing what to a lot of parents, uh, myself included, is the most valuable thing a school can do, getting our kids out of our houses. So thank you to all the bus drivers. I'll go next. Um, basically, I, I, I truly appreciate on behalf of all of us uh, of what everyone is doing to uh, get back at to in-person school and um, how well it's working and um, being so grateful to, you know, our teachers for doing an outstanding job, our administrators, uh, all of our support staff, and uh, they deserve a lot of kudos. So I, I'm glad that, uh, Kevin, you mentioned that. And likewise, um, uh, giving our, our staff and all these folks, just such great praise under the conditions that we've been working in. Uh, I also want to add that um, Project Parkway has been uh, an institution for 10, 11, 12 years. And I've had the privilege of working on the steering committee during this period of time. And um, it's just remarkable what has been accomplished in the strategic planning process. It's been very consistent over the years. Uh, so many goals, objectives, and initiatives uh, have been accomplished. Uh, there's a long list of, of them, and I wish I could give them all to you tonight, but uh, they're available. And uh, it's one of the more consistent projects uh, that's uh, been established uh, in the district that uh, we can all count on to uh, move our district forward. And uh, we started our, our next session this past week and a half ago. And I want to thank Chelsea Watson for uh, taking the leadership of the steering committee and uh, uh, helping to move everything forward. I'll just quickly mention uh, last week, Sam and I attended the most recent uh, meeting of the equity task force for Parkway. Um, that group has one more main set of meetings where we'll be presenting recommendations to each other. Um, one of the things I was excited to see start to happen last week as groups previewed their recommendations is a real shift to, in addition to having recommendations around training and development and those kinds of things, some real movement towards thinking about policies and structures and the way that kind of systems and structures around the district will or will not support the goals that we're all trying to achieve through that work. So looking forward to um, that task force wrapping up its work and the work kind of coming to the board for further consideration um, for the next steps the district wants to take. And I'll just quickly add that we do have a um, school resource officer review. Our first meeting will be coming up on Thursday too and I'm part of that committee. So looking forward to that process going forward and we'll definitely report back to the board as we go along. Thank you, Matt. Um, 
yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, I also want to echo uh, Debbie and uh, Kevin's comments about all those who've who've uh, stepped up uh, with everything, uh, the weather this week. I know our facilities crews uh, saw some video of them out clearing uh, sidewalks and in parking lots today. And uh, it, it was a brutal day to be out there uh, doing that. And uh, we really appreciate their efforts uh, to uh, provide a safe place for our kids to come back to school. Um, there's also, uh, also worth mentioning some of the administrators who have, have braved the elements the last few days to go take care of, of, uh, of different livestock, if you will, uh, at different schools. I know of one administrator who had to go shovel out the chicken coop. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's admirable that they're, uh, they're taking care of, uh, of those uh, creatures at our schools. Um, I also want to mention uh, and acknowledge this is uh, the last board meeting that we will have uh, Dr. Wallen with us. Uh, she's, uh, she's leaving to pursue a, a new opportunity out of town, and uh, we uh, have been so fortunate to have her with us for these last five, six, seven years, and um, we will definitely miss your, your leadership and guidance. Uh, we look forward to spending a little bit more time with Catherine Park here in the next, uh, in the next little while, but uh, we know uh, you, you have us set up for uh, success under Dr. Under Ms. Park's leadership uh, going forward for the time being. And uh, so we thank you and we wish you well uh, in your new endeavor. Uh, also want to mention that uh, I, I, every day, I'm, every single morning, one of the first things I do is I get on Parkway's website and I, I look at the numbers and, and see where our quarantine numbers are, where our positive cases are, and our the, how those compare with the trends in St. Louis. And it looks like our numbers have been uh, continuing to improve, just as uh, the St. Louis community has. Um, I, I can, I can uh, certainly attribute to that to a lot of the, uh, a lot of the programs that we have in place to help uh, reinforce healthy habits in our schools with our students and staff. So I'm appreciative of all those efforts by so many. So thank you all. Uh, Dr. Marty, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, thank you. Uh, you covered many of the things uh, as board members that I was gonna mention, including uh, Dr. Wallen and um, appreciation of her uh, work. She was actually on KMOX this morning for a couple of interviews, did a great job of uh, kind of explaining the last um, CDC recommendations and Parkway's pretty much in line with those. So she'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit as well. Uh, I just want to also mention, uh, uh, we're certainly monitoring weather. Uh, uh, maybe we got one more uh, uh, front coming through here, a blast, and then hopefully get warmer. But uh, we have uh, in, in our calendar, we built in three days and we've used two. So after a, a third day, if we have to use a third day, the fourth day will be a virtual uh, learning day. And uh, so that would be communicated uh, among other things when we uh, have to use that third day and we're keyed up and ready to do that. So just wanna make um, you and our public aware of that. Um, again, I too want to thank all, uh, all the, our grounds people are, who have been working uh, so hard, uh, especially the last 24 hours. Um, a lot of snow out there, a lot of uh, movement uh, to get uh, things ready. So thank them and everybody else and also thank the community for their patience. Um, and, and it's always difficult and I know people have different feelings about uh, when we can announce, but we're, we try to be as diligent as we can and careful. Uh, in terms of how we proceed, but always safety is, is number one, certainly of safety of everyone. I also just mentioned I had the opportunity to uh, visit the new Spark classroom at Chesterfield, Chesterfield Mall, and that program, uh, we haven't heard much about it, it's going well. All the strands are um, have had to kind of uh, meet there now because of some of the uh, closures at some of the other off-campus sites, but they're doing very, very well, and enrollment for next year is very high. And I also had a chance to visit with the early college students uh, that are at Wildwood. And we'll talk more about them and honor our first uh, graduating class of uh, students who will graduate with an associate degree and high school diploma this uh, spring. So uh, some, some uh, updates on uh, those programs, just wanted to provide uh, really proud of the instructors and the staffs uh, uh, hanging in there and also the students who are doing some magnificent things. They're, some of the work that they're doing, their projects is just uh, really very, very positive. Uh, so thank you and thanks again board members for your nice comments and recognition of so many. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I have no uh, board subcommittee reports to share. Uh, Matt mentioned the uh, SRO review coming up and uh, we will report back on that uh, accordingly. Next, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented in the February 16th, 2021 board materials. So moved. Second. Second, Debbie, thank you. Uh, is there anything to be pulled to action or closed? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries 7-0. Next, we have uh, no action items. We have no policy review tonight. However, we do have two reports to share. Uh, the first is that our future planning and COVID information uh, update. So I'd like to welcome uh, in, in no particular order of uh, reporting, uh, Dr. Kevin Beckner, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching, Learning and Accountability, Dr. Robin Wallen, Director of Health Services and Dr. Chelsea Watson, Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, President Todd, Vice President Hopper, members of the board, Dr. Marty, I'm so grateful have this last opportunity to speak with you again tonight about the COVID-19 pandemic and its current impact on Parkway schools. Next slide, please. It's hard to believe that it was almost exactly a year ago when we began to realize that we were facing a worldwide public health crisis, seriously more significant than anything any of us had previously experienced in our lives and that it could prevent, present some very serious disruption to life as we knew it. Preparing for this evening has given me a chance to look back and reflect on all that's happened in the past 12 months. We've gone from dusting off an outdated three-page pandemic plan last Friday, or last February, to developing a responsive, tiered, robust pandemic plan, to planning and implementing distance learning, to supporting the social and emotional needs of our students, to implementing new and rigorous mitigation measures, to developing a system for tracking, contact tracing, and reporting the impact of co the coronavirus on our schools, to ultimately successfully bringing students and staff back into our buildings with new strict protocols to help keep our schools healthy and safe places to learn. Sometimes I get caught up in the day-to-day -day details of this work, and I fail to remember how far we've, we've come and how much we've accomplished. It takes my breath away to pause and reflect on this journey tonight. I wanna to share with you an update from this, on the CDC guidelines that were released last week and review the data from our state, region, and school district. Then I'll share some of my thoughts about this work moving forward. It was really good to see the CDC come out with more specific guidance for schools last week. And to note rather proudly that Parkway has already implemented virtually all of the recommended steps, steps for bringing students and staff safely back to our schools in person. Next slide. Here on this slide, you see what the CDC calls its operational strategy for reopening schools. Included are recommendations for equity to ensure that disadvantaged children from low resource communities have access to educational environments. The work of Parkway to ensure access to technology, social supports such as food and social services are examples of the supports Parkway has integrated into our plans. We are also very sensitive to the disproportionate impact COVID-19 may have on some students and are actively providing support for traumatized students. Additionally, the CDC describes the essential elements of safe K-12 in-person instruction. This includes includes layered mitigation strategies, sounds familiar, including universal mask wearing, physical distancing and hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and contact tracing with isolation and quarantine protocols. The CDC has also advised schools to work with public health authorities to assess the level of community risk. They specifically advise following the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons over the last seven days and the positivity rate. And both these metrics we have been following closely throughout the pandemic. And they also point to the use of phased learning modes, which are reflective in the level of community transmission. 
These guidelines support providing the option of virtual learning for those at increased risk of severe illness and cohorting of students to help facilitate contact tracing and minimize transmission. The guidance also addresses the need for diagnostic testing for those with symptoms of COVID-19. We're fortunate to have re readily available testing in our community and free testing for Parkway staff through care APC clinics. Finally, the vaccination of teachers and staff is recommended as soon as the supply of vaccine is available. Next slide. The CDC has also simplified the indicators and thresholds for community transmission of COVID-19. As we look at our data over the, in the next few slides, you'll see that we are currently falling in the moderate transmission level for total new cases and positivity. They point out that when school and community mitigation strategies are implemented, the risk of transmission in a school will decrease even during periods of high community transmission. Next slide. Here, uh, this is really difficult to see, but what we see here are the phased mitigation strategies across the spectrum of community transmission. And although it's, it's difficult to read, suffice it to say that the most specific guidance we've received from the CDC about decisions for in-person instruction and extracurricular sports and activities is included here. They have addi an additional table for those schools that elect to do routine surveillance screening of students and staff. Next slide. So where are we now? This familiar slide from the St. Louis County Department of Public Health looks at the trajectory of the pandemic over time. Here we can appreciate that there is a definite downward trajectory of the seven day rolling average of new cases. You can also see that there were an average of 168 new daily cases over the past week in St. Louis County. While we, are definitely, while we definitely have circulating virus still in our county, these numbers are a significant improvement over the more than 900 daily cases that we were experiencing in the late fall. Next slide. This is another way to look at that same data over time, looking at Missouri in the purple there and St. Louis County in the red. And you can see that both of those graphs are very similar in their shape. We're currently in ex currently experiencing similar rates of infection as to what we had in July and August of last year. Next slide. This is a new data point that I've not shared before, but I appreciate it because it more clearly depicts the two waves that we've been through during this pandemic. This graph looks at the deaths over time for St. Louis County residents. We can see very clearly here the two distinct waves of the pandemic. Interestingly, the 1918 influenza pandemic provides some stark comparisons to our current situation. In 1918, there was a spring wave followed by a more deadly fall wave, just as we've seen in the SARS-CoV-2 virus. During the 1918 flu pandemic, there was an additional wave of illness the following winter. All pandemics come in waves. But there are differences between these pandemics and COVID-19 has affected way more people throughout the world than the 1918 pandemic. But we also have vaccines that are rolling out which did not exist in 1918. We'll see what the future holds, but we need to be prepared for the possibility of a another wave next winter. Next slide. So the good news of decreasing COVID activity is also very visible in this summary chart that Ed Plus provides to superintendents every week. Here we see the seven day average rate per 100,000 significantly lower than it was even a month ago. Likewise, for the first time since last summer, the transmission rate has dropped below one. This is very good to see and means that each individual with COVID is infecting less than one additional person. Likewise, the positivity rate has dropped to just under 7%, similar to where we were in September and October. Next slide. And then this table looks at youth living in Parkway's geographic footprint. And here too, we see the numbers of school-aged children diagnosed with COVID-19 in the period from 127 to 210, dropping to just over 45 cumulatively, a significant decrease. Next slide. 
And here, as President Todd mentioned, is our dashboard today. And we note the decreasing numbers of students and staff who are both infected and quarantined, a significant decrease. Next slide. So what is ahead as we move into spring? First, we hope to be able to facilitate vaccinations for school staff when vaccines become available. We are exploring partnerships with area vaccinators and will actively be working on this until we can ensure that everyone who wants a vaccine can receive one. DESE indicated recently that individuals who are in the priority group of 1B tier three, which includes school staff, have access to vaccine sometime in April. As you know, the vaccine rollout has been problematic and slower than we hoped. Healthcare providers have received vaccines and I'm so proud that 100% of our school health staff have chosen to be vaccinated. Our school nurses are incredible advocates for vaccination and are continuing to serve as a resource to staff who may have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. Here um, we see some new data that EdPlus is presenting on the percentage of the population who have received at least one vaccine. And although this is kind of hard to read, if you look um, at, the, at the column for St. Louis County, you can see that um, St. 7.1%, I'm sorry, St. Louis County is 9.1% um, have received one vaccine, but only 3.9% have received two doses of the vaccine. If this uh, rate of vaccination continues, it'll take a very, very long time for all the adults to be vaccinated who want vaccines. So we're hopeful that as vaccine supply increases, we will see um, raising rates of vaccine um, administration also. Next slide. So I wish I could tell you that all this good news on the data front means that the pandemic is over. We're all so incredibly tired of the loss, isolation, and disruption that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to our world, to our nation, to our state, to our community, to our district, and to our own lives. As vaccines become more available and more individuals get vaccinated, and as vaccines for children are approved and administered, my hope is that we'll be turning a corner permanently. The reality, however, is there are looming concerns about variant strains of the virus and that could potentially be more easily transmitted and may not be well controlled by currently developed vaccines. All pandemics, as I mentioned before, come in waves. And while we are coming down off this current very deadly wave, health experts believe that there may be another wave sometime in the coming year. We will be challenged to remain vigilant, to continue the mitigation measures that we already have in place and to be very mindful that this journey is not over. We are very much in need of a partnership with our community to ensure that the pandemic remains under control moving forward. And time will tell for certain, but um, I believe our behaviors now may make a significant difference in the outcome moving forward. Next slide. So uh, as uh, President Todd mentioned and Dr. Marty mentioned, tonight is my last presentation to the Parkway School Board. You all have certainly heard from me more frequently during the past year, and I am thankful, very thankful for the tangible ways that you continue to support school health services in Parkway. It's been such a pleasure serving this district and being a part of the creative, compassionate, collaborative, and caring work that's so active and evident in so many ways in this place. Working for Parkway and supporting school health services as the director of health services has been an incredibly rewarding experience and the highlight of my career as a school health leader. While my move to Virginia is important to me personally, it's with a heavy heart that I say goodbye to a place where I've been nurtured, supported, and valued. For this, I will be forever grateful. Next slide. But the work of health services continues even as I leave, and I have the pleasure tonight of introducing you to Catherine Park, who will become the Interim Director of Health Services at the end of the month, while the district conducts a search for a permanent director. Nurse Park has 17 and a half years of experience as a school nurse in Parkway, where she served as a school nurse at McKelvey, Oak Brook, as a float nurse, and currently as a school nurse at Fairmont Elementary. 
She has received many honors during her school nursing career, including being named the Missouri School Nurse of the Year at, by the Missouri Association of School Nurses in 2020. Many in Parkway will recognize Catherine as she has served as our diabetes expert in the district and trained literally hundreds of people in the management of diabetes in the school setting. This spring, Catherine also finish, is finishing up her Doctorate of Nursing Practice degree at Mizzou with an emphasis in nursing leadership. During the pandemic, Catherine has led a group of school nurses who are planning for COVID mass vaccination events and recently had an article about this planning process approved for publication. So as sad as I am to leave this work, I know that I'm leaving you in great hands moving forward. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Park as the Interim Director of Health Services. Thank you. And there she is. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Welcome. Park, Nurse Park. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallen. Um, yeah. We look forward to, to hearing uh, your successes on the East Coast and uh, look forward to working with Nurse Park uh, in the coming months. Is there anything else uh, from your presentation uh, from Dr. Beckner or Dr. Watson? Okay, do we, do we wanna have any, any questions now uh, regarding Dr. Wallen's presentation or are we waiting until the end of this? Uh... Okay, so I'm if anyone has any questions, questions for, yeah. if anyone has any questions for Dr. Wallen regarding what she just presented, uh, now is your time. I have one question about the vaccination process for our teachers and our staff. If we're lucky and it starts in April, <coughs> how long will it take even to get all of our staff and teachers fully vaccinated? And I know you can't be exact at all, but <laughs> is it before the end of the year kind of thing? Are we actually gonna be done by May with this process? So our plan is to partner with a vaccinator. So the state has turned down um, applications from school districts to be vaccinators. So we tried that. But, they, but we can partner with a vaccinator, such as a hospital system or other um, organization that's giving vaccine and hopefully um, help provide the vaccine ourselves and hopefully some kind of mass, um, mass vaccination event. So our plan would be to get it done as soon as we possibly could in April and May. So yes, but once again, it's very much at the, uh, at the whim of when that will be available, but we have we have been in contact with two vaccinators that are interesting in part interested in partnering with us. Okay. Uh, do we have anything from Dr. Watson or Dr. Beckner? Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Rooks. So I'm just gonna review a little bit uh, regarding the beginning of second semester. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rooks. As you all know, second semester started on January 5th and based on all accounts, students and staff appear to be falling into a routine as much of a routine as possible during this pandemic. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to share just a few pictures right now of what's occurring in our schools. Here you see a middle school and you have a Spanish classroom and the teacher said, it's good to have them here. They are really good. We also see some kids engaging in physical activity. It was a choice day. And just a sample for those of you who have not been in our schools to see a sample of what the arrows and lines look like to keep our kids on the right, the correct side of uh, the hallway and the stairs. And all of our schools are outfitted with arrows and painter's tape to provide directions for our kids. Next slide. Here you'll see an elementary school. And this teacher shared with me a lot of uh, 
positives about being back at school. Um, she said, it's so happy to be back in person. I love being here. And this was indoor recess and uh, the kids were getting some exercise um, since it was too cold to go outside. This is a kindergarten class and they were just having a wonderful time. We can move to the next slide, thank you. This was a second grade classroom and the kids were doing flashlight reading. They had an opportunity to engage in flashlight reading after the mini lesson. And I was able to observe this teacher teaching the mini lesson. And when she was finished, she said to the kids, you know, I really want you to think about your work. And if you're not feeling really confident about how you did, I want you to stay on the floor so we can go over it again or go over it a different way. And those of you who are feeling confident, you can head on back to your seats and do some flashlight reading. And the kids just quickly transitioned back to their seat got their flashlight, the lights went off, and they started reading. Thank you. And here we see a couple of our building administrators, one doing lunch supervision. This is a school where the kids are eating in their classrooms based on the size of the cafeteria. And we have another administrator celebrating Black history with uh, her t-shirt and a student's t-shirt. So lots of positives going on in schools. Next slide. Middle school art. Um, this art teacher had kids do a self portrait of, um, of them wearing masks and write a little caption about it. And this particular student said, I think when I'm older, I will remember how school was so odd and different. And it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be wearing a mask. In addition, you see um, a school celebrating back Black history. The teachers are engaged in door decorating and uh, they had just started putting um, some things on the door. And I saw this one and snapped a picture as I thought uh, we many of us have seen this wonderful movie and uh, can remember um, this uh, visual. And the last pictures I wanna share with you happened to be a high school cafeteria. You know, we had lots of conversation early on as to how we were gonna keep kids safe in the cafeteria, especially in our secondary schools and track where they're seated. And you can see on the table, there's a QR code and there's um, each seat has a letter assigned to it. So kids scan the QR code, put their name in and document what seat they are seated in. And this helps our administrators when they need to do contact tracing. But you can also see how the kids are spread out uh, in the cafeteria as well. So just a, a glimpse, I know uh, our board members, I know you like to be in our schools a lot and we are uh, not having visitors in our school. So I thought for you and others, uh, just to see a few visuals of what's going on to see that it's uh, we're pretty much uh, back to a normal routine, except we typically don't have to scan in where we, seat, uh, where we sit for lunch. The next thing I'd like to just uh, mention and uh, is the schedule. We continue to be very appreciative of the calendar that we have for second semester. And you can see with the arrow, this is where we are uh, today on the 16th. But we also, as you all know, have distance learning days. And this particular quarter, we have five distance learning days. And we also have distance learning days scheduled for fourth quarter. Our distance, distance learning days have allowed our custodial teams to do some deep cleaning for our classrooms and other areas of the school. We're committed to additional cleaning, disinfecting and sanitizing our classrooms and schools frequently throughout the school day and week. But having this distance learning day, some, you know, sometimes it's once, you know, every week and sometimes we don't have it during um, a particular week, but it really has uh, paid off as far as getting to more areas of the building um, to get that deeper cleaning and more intentionally. The distance learning days have also provided time for contact tracing. Early on when we were blended or when we were all engaged in distance learning, 
we did notice that a lot of um, communication occurred from families or staff on the weekend or on Mondays. And so I will tell you that our administrators do spend Saturdays and Sundays and Mondays and all other days of the week, but a lot of times on the weekends doing and Mondays doing some contact tracing. And it takes a lot of time. Dr. Wallen has made sure that all of us have gone through, what was that, eight hours of training for our uh, to be able to be a contact tracer. In addition, Dr. Wallen has uh, scheduled meetings with those of us who are contact tracers. And we have a very specific protocol that we follow that um, takes quite a bit of time using the tape measure and talking to folks and um, making those follow-up phone calls when we have to, uh, to quarantine any students or staff members. And so speaking of quarantines, I just want to highlight what our students are doing and what our teachers are doing when we have quarantines, because we all knew when we came back, we would still have quarantines. So in elementary school, we've asked all of our elementary teachers to keep their Schoology pages up to date. So parents and students can go on the Schoology page to find out what they need to do when they're quarantined. We've asked our teachers to invite students to join at the beginning of the morning for morning meeting or community circle. And during the day, we ask students to participate in asynchronous learning. Our very own instructional specialists, instructional coaches have recorded mini lessons for every reading, writing, and math lesson. This allows the students to watch the lessons and engage in the assignments as their schedule permits. There are learning boards posted for science, social studies, and phonics in K2. And in these areas, students have some choice in regards to what they're gonna do to demonstrate that they are understanding the concept. And as far as our specials classes are concerned, you know, art and music and PE, we also certainly want to engage kids who are quarantined um, in, with some live instruction to help keep that connection to the school community as much as possible. So the specials teachers uh, provide a learning menu of asynchronous learning activities in Schoology, and they offer opportunities for students to engage in live instruction during their scheduled specials class. We ask our classroom teachers and our specialists to have at least one personal check-in a week with students. And I also want you to know there are specific quarantining protocols in place for students who receive special education, intervention, mosaics, and EL services. I also do want to note that some of our teachers have found success in Zooming students in from home during many lessons. And many of them wish to continue that, and they have, and they certainly may. But what I described to you earlier are the expectations for all of our elementary teachers when students are quarantined. Now moving on to secondary, teachers have also been provided with information to keep posted on their Schoology page. In middle school, if a student is absent four days or less, the teachers provide asynchronous activities for the students. For middle school students who exceed four days of absence and high schoolers, we ask that students participate in learning and instruction by Zoom to receive that live instruction. Clearly, if a child is ill and can't maintain that schedule, the teacher and the administrators work together with the students and parents to determine how that learning can occur when the student is feeling better. And lastly, in regards to quarantines, our teachers are also quarantined. And when teachers are quarantined, they work with their building administrator to determine an appropriate plan to support students and their learning. And this could mean that a substitute is requested. And this is usually when a teacher is ill and can't teach. If the teacher is still able to teach, the teacher works with the classroom remotely. And in this case, the administrator assigns a substitute or an, another supervisor or certified teacher 
to be in the classroom with the students while the teacher is providing instruction during this quarantine period. If the entire class is quarantined and the teacher is healthy, everyone shifts to distance learning during that time. And lastly, I wanna to touch on just a few pieces of school operations. I know we've talked about school operations quite a bit over the months, but as Dr. Wallen mentioned, I just wanna make sure that everyone knows that our schools continue to do their very best in following the protocols to keep everyone safe. There continues to be questions regarding social distancing. And again, the goal is six feet. We communicated and knew that once we returned, this wouldn't be feasible in all areas. Thus, we continue to ask our educators to do the very best they can as they facilitate teaching and learning. We continue to limit individuals who enter our schools to help with contact tracing and to keep our students and staff as safe as possible. And I do want you to know that schools are making plans for some of those annual end of the year activities and events. As we can all imagine, these will look different but the most important thing is that we provide as many opportunities for students that we can based on some of the traditions that we have in the safest manner possible, as we all wanna be a part of the solution and not add to our community spread. And lastly, and I think Dr. Wallen mentioned it, and I just wanna reiterate, is we all need to do our part to keep our schools open. We wanna continue seeing those numbers go down and we must all follow the mitigation strategies in school and outside of school that have been widely communicated. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Beckner. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Watson. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly just on three pieces of our planning for the upcoming school year. Um, so that the board can be aware and ask any questions. So we know that Parkway Virtual Campus um, was new this year and will continue for next year. At current, there are over 5,000 students who are enrolled in Virtual Campus. Um, Mr. Rooks, if you'll hit that. And then by level, uh, we do see that it's fairly consistent based on the number of, gr of grade levels at each level. So over 2,000 elementary and high school students, over 1,200 middle school students. Uh, the next graph is by grade, uh, with the lowest grade at each level um, being kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth grade. So we can see the number of students by grade level is fairly consistent with our lowest being elementary um, at just over three, or I'm sorry, our lowest being kindergarten at just over 300 students, um, with well over 500 in some of our high school grade levels. Now, we also know, as we've shared before, that the number of students selecting virtual campus across the district is not evenly distributed, and we do see a much higher percentage of families selecting a virtual option, both in the north and central areas than we see in the south and west areas, with really the north area being the heaviest concentration of families selecting virtual campus for their students. Uh, we also did ask back in November, this group of families who are participating in virtual campus, do you plan to continue in virtual campus next school year? And as a reminder, we showed you this uh, back, I believe in December, uh, but the number of families who said, based on their experience, would you re-enroll was over 60% of families saying, yes, we would definitely re-enroll with another 20% saying, you know, if some changes were made, we would re-enroll. This was a key piece of information that told us we really need to continue virtual campus um, into the future to allow families to have that option. Um, though we recognize that the number ultimately who select virtual campus would certainly be lower than what we see there. Um, but we are beginning to ask our families their preference for next school year, particularly at the high school level, since the course guides are unique for both virtual campus and the in-person schools. So the timeline for asking families whether they want a virtual or in-person experience next year is high school actually just completed uh, their first indication of whether they want virtual campus or in-person for next school year. We did allow families who selected virtual campus now, we told them the opportunity will be there if you want to switch back to in-person in May. So those decisions will become final um, only after about the first week of May. 
Um, so families will be able to make those changes if they selected virtual um, during the registration process. For both elementary and middle school families, we'll begin that process in late April and close it in early May so that we can be closer to the beginning of the school year so families can get a better sense of the vaccine rollout so we can get a, a closer look at what the health and safety situation might be looking like for next school year before families have to finalize that decision. Now, if high school is any indication, I'll share with you some information from what we saw in that initial request for high school students. And that was um, approximately, Mr. Rooks, if you would go to the next slide. 78% of families overall said they would prefer an in-person experience for next school year at the high school level with 22 selecting virtual. Now, again, because we told families, if you select virtual, you'll have the chance to switch back. We do anticipate that 78% of students in person will be, um, that will be the low mark. That will just continue to go up from here. And um, we are likely to see the end result virtual campus at our high school level be somewhere between 10 and 15% of our families selecting a virtual option at the high school level for next school year. Um, and that will also, uh, potentially follow some patterns for our middle and, and elementary school students. So we anticipate high school may be the highest uh, percentage of families choosing virtual at that level. We also do see, as I noted earlier, that the uh, percent of families choosing a virtual experience in the North area is highest. And certainly that was the case in this initial go round with about 20% of our families in Central, South and West selecting a virtual, the virtual campus, uh, where in the North area, that was closer to 35%. So we are still continuing to see that trend that we saw earlier um, hold true for students and family selection for next school year. So we do have some things planned uh, for next year, which includes how we integrate virtual campus and how we integrate our in-person experiences. And these are some of the conversations that we're having. So one, um, to facilitate virtual campus, we will need to have common schedules, both at our middle and high schools. We do have those this year, um, but we will be continuing that at the middle and high school level for next school year. The high school team is working on that currently, and that group includes teachers, um, department leaders, principals, all having that conversation about what that schedule should look like for next year. Uh, it will mean a return to a semester schedule at the high school level. If you recall, we had to move to a quarter schedule to facilitate some of the changes for this year. And middle school uh, teachers will be receiving a survey prior to spring break. We'll be collecting information about uh, this year. Middle school for the first time is in a block schedule, again, to facilitate things like um, limiting the amount, number of students, uh, individual children come into contact with during the school day. So we'll be serving our teachers to see how that is working in the in-person setting. Uh, and we'll get that information prior to spring break so that we'll be able to figure out exactly what that middle school schedule looks like. And we've had a lot of questions about what, what will be the health and safety measures required next school year. And what we can say is uh, whatever is recommended at that time is what will remain in place. So for example, if masking is still a recommended strategy in August, then we'll continue masking. We'll just have to see what exactly the situation uh, requires, uh, given whatever, whatever uh, health reality we are faced with come August. But we will continue whatever is required uh, to keep our students safe. Um, then we're having some additional conversations um, about how exactly virtual campus will interact with home schools. So we did things this year to ensure that our students could have a quality experience, whether they're choosing virtual campus or choosing an in-person setting, uh, but not all of those were necessarily decisions that had the long term in mind. But now that we know virtual campus will be with us, and we are having conversations about what is the best integration of virtual campus so that it um, plays nicely with all of our existing homeschools. So how do we make that integration happen? That includes things like, um, what's the relationship between the homeschools and virtual campus? Um, what's the appropriate counseling and administrative support for students who continue to learn virtually? Is the counselor at the homeschool also servicing students in virtual campus? Do teachers in virtual campus 
um, have to reach out to family or reach out to principals and counselors from multiple schools if there's a challenge with a student. So that work and many other things will uh, continue as part of our virtual advisory work, which is a group uh, comprised of teachers from across multiple levels and appropriate stakeholders to the um, virtual side of our organization to determine what are some of the appropriate decisions to make so that we can really create a smooth system for both our in-person students and our virtual students, as well as our teachers who are teaching virtually and our teachers who are teaching in person. Um, lastly, uh, I told you there were three things. So we talked about um, some of our in-person planning, some of our virtual planning, and now some of our summer school planning. This summer, we'll be partnering with Parkway Rockwood Community Ed to provide our enrichment opportunities for our students. Um, and from the Parkway side, we'll be focusing on K-8 math, reading, and writing support. So we will be really focused on closing some of those learning gaps that may have emerged during the pandemic. And we are more than doubling the number of invitations we are putting out to students for those support classes. Um, our principals, assistant principals, summer school coordinators um, have all been working hard to make sure that um, we're identifying the right students for those classes and sending out invitations while making sure that um, we're really finding those students who would most benefit from that type of support. And so we'll continue to provide more information about that as the summer gets closer and appreciate the chance to talk about some of our future planning. With that, I think we'll take any questions you might have. I don't have any questions, uh, but I would like to thank you all for the detailed uh, report. Um, it's, it's important to have some of these answers uh, out of the way and, and really start to focus on where families can, uh, they can make decisions uh, for next, next school year. So thank you for that. Anyone else have anything they'd like to add or any questions for Dr. Watson or Dr. Beckner? It sounds like the, um, I think one of the concerns and challenges this last year was virtual learning and the quarantine situation and whether or not people could um, move in and out of virtual campus if they wanted to. Um, and that we were not able to make those accommodations for virtual moving in and out all the time. But it sounds like things are improving with the ability to zoom in to the classroom to keep on track if you're in quarantine. Would you agree with that, that that, that seems to be improving so that we, we don't have to be as concerned anymore with um, trying to accommodate more virtual learners uh, and teachers that with the capability of Zoom a little bit better that we're able to make better accommodations that way? That certainly has been our strategy and how we've um, had to respond to the pandemic. Um, though I hesitate to say a lot of positives about that approach just because we know how incredibly challenging it is for our teachers. Sure. And we know that if you're a student who might be the only person participating via Zoom, you're less likely to get the kind of attention you would get as the, the in-person students are getting. Um, but you are correct, uh, Ms. Hopper, that that has been the strategy we have used to really um, address the need for people who want to move back and forth. You're correct also that uh, virtual campus uh, has been closed, that the demand exceeded the number of seats that we had. Mm -hmm. So our goal for next year, as we really look forward, is um, we really would love, other than students quarantined, to not have students zooming in to the classroom that that wouldn't be the expectation for our teachers. Again, unless we know quarantines, there's nothing we can do about that. That's a necessary health measure that we have to take to keep everybody, everybody in our schools safe. Um, but as we head into August and planning for next school year, we would really like it to be um, that we can say, if you are a student learning virtually, you get a dedicated teacher who's focused on you. And if you're a student who's learning in person, you get a dedicated teacher who's focused on you. And if you're a teacher, you can know this is the setting that I'm teaching in. 
again, qualifying that quarantines will always be a reality. But that is our goal, and you are correct that that is how we have um, accommodated some of those changes by allowing students to zoom in um, and our teachers. Well, we know it's incredibly challenging. Um, we're grateful for everything they're doing for those students uh, to make it work for them in what is not an ideal situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Evan, just to follow up on that, just thinking about going into next year, if we think that quarantining is still going to be a reality that we're dealing with, are there any opportunities to problem solve ways that we could accommodate quarantining students that don't involve that additional burden on teachers um, with the luxury of a little bit of extra planning time? It's possible. In part, that's going to depend on what the quarantine guidelines are. We know that in mm. some places they've um, lessened the number of days uh, that quarantines have to go and those sorts of things. If that were the case, then certainly we could look at some other, other options for how we could address that. If we're still looking at very lengthy quarantines, um, then really to keep students connected to the classroom, there's, there aren't gonna be many other options that are better than what we currently have. Um, but certainly it's something we'll keep monitoring, keep looking at to see if there's a, a better way to do it for both our teachers and our students. Uh, how has the substitute planning been going? Are, are you finding, I know at one time there was a, an incredible shortage of substitutes to come in when teachers were out. Uh, have, you, have you seen any remedy to that challenge right now? Mike, do you wanna take this one? You have to unmute first. There we go. Debbie, we're finding that there's certain days of the week that we do have trouble uh, getting subs. Our Friday unfilled rate is higher than other days of the week. Um, but uh, along with getting Kelly substitutes, as well as having staff members uh, fill the role and get paid for the extra hours, um, our, our fill rate is around a high 80%, 87, 88%. So, um, that leaves administrators and others filling the void when needed uh, to help cover classes uh, and, and other personnel uh, that they'll reach out to, you know, Kevin's uh, department coordinators, administrators, district administrators, et cetera. But uh, we're finding it's getting better. Uh, we're looking also at a ability to uh, maybe increase one building level sub uh, at the high school level. Uh, our high schools are finding, our, our data with high schools are a little higher than the other uh, levels. And when we started looking at building subs in the fall, we were looking to have one at elementary school and two at the high school. Now every school has two building subs, but uh, we do feel there might be a need to add one more building sub at the high school level, uh, increasing them to three. Um, and we find, again, that the building level sub is helpful. Uh, we have a lot of people that are uh, joining in to be or to uh, fill that role of a building level sub because they're guaranteed uh, every day uh, a placement for a lengthy period of time. And so um, that's also helpful. But again, uh, as I started, Fridays are the, are the hard days uh, to fill. Um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are a little easier. Uh, but uh, Again, with Mondays, uh, most of our Mondays being distance learning days, um, we don't have subs on those days uh, necessary uh, in the building. Thank you. Anyone else have any other questions? Okay, thank you again for your detailed report. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Greg Matheson, Assistant Superintendent of Student Services, uh, joining us to talk about the Alliance for Healthy Communities update. All right, good evening. President Todd, Vice President Hopper, Board of Directors, and Dr. Marty, thank you for having me here tonight to introduce Ken McManus, the Director of the Alliance for Healthy Communities, Ken has worked in the Parkway community for many years and has created a robust system that is a platform for community collaboration, 
inspiration and calls to action to address the epidemic of drug abuse as well as suicide prevention. I've been fortunate to work with Ken for the past two years in Parkway as the Assistant Superintendent of Student Services. And I also had the opportunity to work with Ken in a similar capacity in my previous district. There's no doubt about it in my mind that Ken is an expert in this area, a valued member of our community and a catalyst for positive change. Tonight, Ken will give you an update on the past, present and future of the Alliance for Healthy Communities. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Ken McManus. Thank you, sir. It seems anything I have to say now is just gonna go downhill. So I, I think we're good, thank you. Um, President Todd, Vice President Hopper, Board of Directors, Dr. Marty, thank you very much for a chance to bring you up to speed on what's been happening with the coalition. It's been a number of years since I presented to the board about our operation and uh, I'm pretty proud of what we've been able to sustain uh, in our vision for the future. Um, we have been, uh, the coalition started in, in 2012, 2013 um, and, and really the, the, the underlying core value was to support Parkway's mission uh, in producing the best students possible by working at a community level to try to strengthen the community on behalf of kids uh, to make it more likely that more kids can come in, into schools and thrive. Um, so um, next slide, I guess. Just Perfect. So our mission is to engage the community to reduce substance abuse and risk for suicide by essentially doing two things, raising awareness, um, but also changing community norms. Um, and as general as those two functions sound, they have a lot of depth uh, in their application. Um, underneath that mission, we have a, an obligation uh, per the legislation that created our current funding stream, the Drug-Free Community Support Grant, that our essential mission beyond what I just read is to really build the community's capacity uh, through partnership recruitment and, and fostering collaboration uh, for the purpose of reducing youth substance abuse. Um, next slide, please. Our theory of change is that if we, through a process of collaboration, can create changes that affect initially parts, small parts even, of, of the, the population that over time in aggregate, we have an impact on the whole. Um, and in some cases of the, the projects, the activities that we have fostered, uh, the, the illustration of that is they started very small, but over the years have gone to a, a, a pretty amazing scale. I'll say more about that in a minute. The graphic on the right, um, we are accountable. No, not in the news, not yet. Um, anyway, all right, so there was a graphic in that. There, wonderful. Um, uh, we are accountable for how we manage our operations to our funder. Um, the graphic intend just to show you that just like everything you guys do, we are abound by data. Um, we are not chasing down every rabbit hole about the, the possibilities, but we work hard to get both hard data as well as uh, community anecdotal data that, that we can use to drive decisions for strategic planning and, and, and assessment outcomes. Um, now, next slide, thank you. Next, thank you. Um, importantly, we are not an agency and we are not a program. Uh, we exist to create a safe, neutral container for building partnerships. Um, and, and that's important because there are agencies in our footprint uh, that have, a, if you will, a, a certain competing agenda. Um, treatment centers that vie for the same population of patients or, or not-for-profit agencies that want access to some of the same involvement. So our role is to connect people. Um, we're not, we have nothing to sell. We are here to create an opportunity for folks to come together as citizen owners, partners, stakeholders uh, who are invested and interested in contributing uh, to a process of, of problem solving. Next slide, please. You'll have to hit it two or three times. There you go. Um, part of that legislation that I referred to requires that our, our coalition look like uh, the community that we serve to the greatest extent. Um, and in one way of that is to, uh, we are uh, obligated, our eligibility is driven by having representatives from each of the 12 sectors you see listed on this slide. Um, and there's, so there's kind of an ongoing, as you might expect, uh, especially over the years, process of recruitment and replacement. Um, but the, the, the point of these sector representations is to bring the expertise uh, and, and, and the intimate knowledge of the community to bear on, on the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. So when we think about uh, impact, 
Uh, there are a variety of ways to, to, to think about that. The first is resources. Um, uh, in the eight years that we've been up and running, we've brought in access to one point, not quite $1.2 million uh, for uh, the Parkway community for uh, community level pre prevention. Um, in that same amount of time, we've had 60 uh, some odd partners who have provided a variety of lenses uh, on substance abuse and prevention, project planning, advocacy, community engagement, recruitment, uh, the, the range of things that it takes to create the partnership process. Um, and absolutely of critical importance are the in-kind resources that our partners provide. And Parkway is absolutely our backbone. Um, the fiscal services team is, uh, uh, the credibility they bring to the game is um, second to none. Um, Dr. Madison and his health and PE team and the Parkway Path uh, team, that super successful partnership with them. Um, but then law enforcement and, and uh, faith-based folks, variety of different organizations and, and even individuals that, that uh, bring their expertise and, and their passion uh, really uh, create the depth that we need to have, have a meaningful impact. Next slide, please. We are entirely grant funded. Um, over the last uh, eight years, we started out with uh, a large grant from the Missouri Foundation for Health. It was a five-year uh, grant um, over those years. And then into the current uh, block, uh, we also accessed funding through an organ a state level agency called ACT Missouri, and then a private foundation called the Tracy Family Foundation. We are in the fifth year of funding with the Drug-Free Communities Support Grant Program. Um, and we are uh, looking forward to submitting an application for another five years in partnership with Parkway. Um, the current grant cycle, the fifth year ends at the end of September, and we are in the process of developing that application now. Um, bul the bulk of our funds have been spent um, on staff, salaries, tax, and fringe. Um, we have traveled with students as well as uh, to some trainings. We have hired consultants for technical assistance on issues ranging uh, from uh, leadership development to uh, project uh, coalition evaluation, uh, assuring the fidelity of what we're doing and a connection uh, to, to outcomes. Next slide, please. So we are hosted in Parkway. Our eyes are largely on the community, but we do things uh, in partnership with, with Parkway teams. Um, and uh, we've had some really delightful success uh, in, in doing that. If we could have the next slide. We have a youth coalition called Teen Voice for Change or TVC. There are four distinct chapters, one at each high school, uh, and then the middle schools, all five middle schools have some health and PE staff who add to their supports to their curriculum uh, when it comes to substance abuse um, that uh, really draw kids into an awareness of uh, prevention and, and healthy choices. Um, so we have been, uh, Julie Knost, some of you may know Julie, she's our part-time project coordinator and she is um, an absolute magician with kids and has been really instrumental in supporting uh, the building level staff uh, that we, to whom we provide a, a small stipend uh, to really engage these kids and keep things focused. Um, and next slide. On two different uh, times, two, in 2018 and 2019, um, we have traveled with uh, Parkway students, high school students, Julie and I being we. Um, in 2018, we took this group of amazing young women uh, to Kissimmee, AKA Flo uh, Orlando, Florida. Um, and the result of this, the, the, the training that we've taken these students to is the National Youth Leader Initiative. It is an international conference um, so our Parkway kids were in the company of about 550 kids from literally around the world. Um, they participated in a very structured uh, training um, that Julie, thankfully, because Julie Knost is, is a former teacher, was able to help them dig in and, and kind of take it to a deeper dive. Um, but six of these young ladies uh, were attendees at South uh, they have moved on, of course, they, it's what kids do. But they're, um, they came back on fire, uh, uh, especially about the vaping and e-cig drama that was unfolding at their school. And as a consequence of their uh, commitment, their passion, and the, what they learned in this training, um, they would, the work that they did led to uh, South High getting a promising practice recognition uh, from character.org, which we were really excited about. Um, next slide, please. In 2019, we took a group of kids um, to Dallas. 
Um, whoever chooses summer conferences in Dallas really needs to rethink that. But nonetheless, um, these kids were equally amazing. And one of the things that I, I've shared with the administrators uh, when I talked to them in December, I'm not a teacher. So when I hear about great things, I appreciate it, but I don't fully grasp it because they don't see it. But in both uh, the Florida trip and the Texas trip, Parkway kids are just class acts and head and shoulders above the, the, the large groups of kids uh, that were there. And in 2019, uh, the staff of the conference, the, the national leaders of the conference recognized that and recruited several of our kids to actually be uh, kind of youth trainers, if you will, in some of the, the conference programming. Um, I was just so very, very proud. Uh, it, it was just a, a real treat to be able to be with these guys and see um, the, what, what Parkway does with these bright young minds. Um, so uh, I honor it tremendously. Next slide, please. We partner uh, with uh, the Parkway Health and PE folks we have for about seven years in providing uh, trainings to students. And this one in particular is called Stand Up Nine. Um, over the last seven years, we've trained actually 417, 470, uh, because we just, in a recreated virtual uh, version of this program, again, courtesy Julie Canost and Debbie Hilke uh, in the Parkway Path uh, uh, operation. Uh, they created this to be a virtual platform. Uh, and so we are at 470 kids. It serves a couple of functions. One is it's a recruitment uh, effort on our part with Eddie and his folks to attract kids into our youth coalition, Teen Voice for Change. But it also helps draw kids in the direction of the PATH uh, peer uh, educator uh, curriculum uh, supports that they do. Um, so it really serves a couple of purposes, um, but it's just been a, a delightful partnership. And this year, I, you know, we, we got it in last year on our normal full day uh, operation uh, at AMP Up before the COVID uh, nightmare settled in on us. Uh, but again, the creative energies and, and talent of, of Julie and Debbie got us uh, on, kept us on track to be able to do this uh, with kids this year virtually. Next uh, slide, please. And our focus is on the community. And we've had a lot of, of activity going on. Um, and some of you have been involved in that or, or connected with it. Um, we have a lot of partners, um, and I'm going to touch on a few of those things quickly. Uh, you may recall we've done town hall meetings on the opioid crisis. In fact, I want to share I heard uh, a new term on a federal webinar that kind of ties the pandemic and the opioid nightmare together it was syndemic, um, that the con confluence of the ongoing opioid overdose, which is now growing to include um, fentanyl and methamphetamines, um, combined with the pandemic uh, distress and, and uh, implosion for so many people. Um, the, the, the overdose epidemic continues to grow. We actually had more overdoses last year than any year prior. Um, but we are working with our partners to try to do things like pull, uh, reduce ac access uh, to, to medications for diversion. And again, keeping kids involved in uh, opportunities. So look, next slide, please. For, uh, it, in 2014, 15, 16, 18, and 19, we've taken kids to Jefferson City as part of a statewide youth advocacy initiative uh, called Speak Hard. It was recently changed to the name Hear Us. Um, but it has just, uh, it's, it's a delightful opportunity to, again, immerse Parkway kids in a larger uh, cohort of state youth uh, with, with heart for the same issues. Um, and it, hopefully no surprise, our Parkway kids stand out head and shoulders. Um, uh, it's, been, it's been an honor uh, and they do a great job. Uh, they take it very seriously. Um, you can see the two guys, uh, uh, Carter Henry and Sam, uh, went in collar and tie and suit. And I promise you, they were the only teenagers in the operation uh, dressed that way. In the bottom left corner were uh, kids, uh, so, um, Savannah Arroyo showed up with a complete poster uh, and, and presentation ready. Uh, it's just, just what our Parkway kids do. Um, again, it's been an honor to, to, to take them. Next slide, please. So um, 
we are very involved in advocacy for policies and, and ordinances and such that can make the community safer. Um, we've been uh, successfully involved in uh, Tobacco 21 ordinance adoptions, both in St. Louis County and the city of Manchester. And I'm pretty confident all of you were on the board when uh, MJ Stricker and uh, Savannah and others came and discussed with you the smoking policy guidelines and, the, and successfully uh, got those updated for the guidelines to match, match the policy. And the, I can tell you the kids were very excited uh, about that uh, accomplishment. Next slide, please. So um, law enforcement has been a stalwart for us in terms of partnerships. And I thought I would just share with you, um, you know, the idea of a series of small uh, um, accomplishments adding up over time. We have made sure through our own donation of lock boxes, drop boxes to both Creve Corps and town and country that every police department in the parkway footprint with the exception of De Pere, uh, has a drop box for 24 hour uh, medication disposal. The only reason De Pere doesn't have it is because their facility doesn't accommodate the supervision these boxes require. We've distributed 30,000 flyers uh, promoting take backs over the last five years. And in those five years, our law enforcement partners have collected over 32,000 pounds, six, however many, 16 tons or whatever of, of unused medication. Um, and we were successful in starting the uh, service to um, independent living centers where residents often have medicines they cannot uh, no longer use, uh, but they lack transportation uh, to get to the resources. So it's been an exciting uh, extension of, of the work that we're doing. Next slide, please. So kind of in, in, a, in summary, the, the benefits I, I feel that are coalition has brought to the community is access to resources, opportunities for Parkway itself to exercise its leadership uh, on behalf of youth health and in support of its larger mission. Um, we had opportunities locally at the state and national level to include kids in some pretty unique uh, and very in-depth trainings. Um, and, and also we brought information and resources to the community that had to be usable for parents uh, to, to assure the safety of their homes and their neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. So all of this is to just to invite uh, the partnership to move forward. Um, we would very much like to submit this application and be funded for another five years and continue the partnership uh, that we've had increase, in fact, the collaborations um, with, with the health and PE team um, uh, in, in messaging and, and with communications. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's opportunity. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just an ongoing challenge to maintain the level of health and wellness that success really uh, requires. And our commitment is to work with you guys as partners to do what we can with, with you in schools, but also, again, to bring the messaging and the resources at the, at the level of community. So thank you for listening um, and thank you for your support very, very much. That's it. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, appreciate hearing that, uh, that report. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll start off questions. You mentioned the submittal of the, of the application to renew the grant. Um, is there potential to increase the, the grant's value? And if you could, how would, how could you augment the, the current offerings if you were able to get additional funding? So the funding is a fixed five years, $125,000 for five years. Um, and there is in-kind match uh, required. Um, so for this next five-year block, it would be 100% match for year six, um, and then 125%, and then 150% by the 10th the year of total operation. But the actual amount of funding available is, a, is fixed at $125,000 per year. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned vaping, and I, I recall uh, those, uh, those students uh, talking to us about vaping and their efforts to uh, contain it in their school. Has, has that, uh, where are we with vaping? Is it, is it increasing? Is it holding steady? Have we got a handle on it? Uh, so hard data. So local hard data is hard to come by. We had just initiated the student Missouri student survey uh, back in March when the COVID thing shut everything down, and we really lost out on that. But I, I don't think it's changed dramatically. I think um, what I'm hearing from kids 
uh, is that there are still plenty of guy, plenty of kids who are still experimenting and playing with it and whatever. And of course, the risk for addiction with nicotine uh, is is very high given the concentration. Um, but I don't think there's a real clear picture of of the usage because again, there so many of them been home uh, and and sheltered and and out of reach. Um, but in in my mind, uh, it is still a live issue that needs our attention. I agree. Uh, and last question. Um... How you mentioned the pandemic? How how has that affected your work, and how have you had to be have you had to adjust to be effective? It's affected us uh, pretty. Frankly, it's been a bit of a gut punch. Um, it's hard to influence the community when we can't access it. Um, I, I and I, I I've got to believe you guys feel so much the same. Um, we've had really great um, uh, attendance. In fact, I'm not sure I'll ever give up Zoom entirely as a meeting vehicle because people can come more than ever. On the other hand, when we'd want to coordinate things like alcohol retailer compliance checks, what we found through the fall and into January even is that uh, uh, the departments with which we were intending to partner uh, were short personnel due to quarantines and, and sickness and so forth. And so it's been a challenge. Uh, simple example like that. Um, again, we met the challenge, I think, on the Stand Up Nine training. Again, Julie and Debbie in particular really did a great job of creating an alternative vehicle for delivering the information and so forth with the kids. Um, but it's been, it's been difficult um, and, and disheartening uh, because the normal routes by which we would know to engage people have been greatly reduced. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to say, uh, uh, Mr. Todd, that I had the chance to participate in uh, Stand Up Nine. Was that last week? I guess last week, right? Yes, two sir. weeks ago. And uh, really well done. And um, really, uh, I just want to congratulate all uh, the folks that uh, participated uh, uh, as adults and kind of moderated. Uh, um, certainly, Ken and, and Julie Canos and and uh, Eddie and and uh, there's others, but uh, it was really well done. So thanks, Ken. Thank you, sir, very much. Well, Ken, I always relish the opportunity to be in your presence and have <laughs> attended numerous town halls and keep an eye on your on your progress and activity. And so just thank you for all that you, you do for your outreach. Um, you have a, a remarkable way of connecting with people and, and our students, and um, that's to be commended. Uh, one, one question that I do have for you is, um, we hear a lot about how the pandemic is affecting the mental health of, of, of youngsters. And is that anything that you're seeing and are you taking that up as part of your, um, your, uh, your endeavors to reach out to our students in the community with how the pandemic is affecting them from a mental health standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think the pandemic's had a lot of different effects on different people of all ages. Um, but I, I think some important ones for the kids with whom I've had contact is uh, loss of touch points, um, you know, access, you know, they can talk to their friends on, on Facebook, not Facebook, uh, FaceTime or, or Zoom or whatever, but it's not like being with somebody. It's not like having the activity. I was, when Chelsea showed the pictures of the kids doing physical activity, uh, there are more than a few with whom I've had contact with that's been greatly lost. Um, uh, so yeah, I think there's just a disillusionment. I, I think there's fear. Uh, about when is this going to end? What's it going to look like? What is life going to become? Um, I hear that even from parents. Um, but yeah, I think the pandemic's been hard on people and, and certainly on kids. Well, thank you all again for having me very, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Um... I have uh, really don't have a whole lot else uh, for this evening. We have no work session, no special meeting. Uh, the next anticipated closed session will be held on March 10th, 2021. Details of the closed session will be posted within 24 hours of the anticipated meeting. Um, we have no closed session tonight. So may I have a motion and a second to adjourn the regular meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you for watching.